Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, so that you can see this in um, other ways. Sometimes it helps to be able to have a visual representation as well as verbal. So this is the media training for sex worker advocates by the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom. Here we go. Uh, I'm Susan Wright. I'm the spokesperson for the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom. I have, actually it's 26 years now at this point in crisis management and I've given a well over a thousand interviews. Um, and uh, a lot of it is more reactive media than proactive. I, I don't consider myself a public relations expert. I do consider myself an expert at uh, crisis mitigation by using the media. So here's the outline of the training for today. We're going to go through some media tips, and that's just general information about the media that you need to be aware of when you're preparing for your interview. Um, we're also going to give you interview tips. And in that, I'm going to talk about bites. Um, in talking to Savannah, we decided we were kind of kind of focus on uh, FOSTA sound bites. And if anybody would like to get a copy of these sound bites so that you can adjust them for yourselves, we'll make the slide deck available for you as well. Uh, and then we're going to look at a couple of very short uh, video clips once we're done with the slideshow. And then we're going to talk about it. Um, Based on, you know, what you've learned today, you know, what are these people doing great? Uh, where can they improve? And that's, of course, when you can answer, uh, ask all of your questions because it will not be recorded. So you can feel free to un, um, unmute yourself and show yourself and ask your questions so we can have a real discussion. All right. So the first thing about sex in the media, I have to tell you, uh, giving an interview any interview about sexuality is challenging. There's just no way around it. Um, there's a tendency for the reporters to repeat stereotypes, for the story to focus on the stereotypes. And um, it's reinforcement of the mainstream conservative views. Uh, and there is an inherent bias toward sensationalism. That means they're going to take whatever you say and pick out the most shocking or um, uh, attention-grabbing thing that they can find. So the chips are definitely stacked against us in doing this, um, especially when whenever we try to talk knowledgeably about sex to the media. Um, so even if you have an, a sympathetic reporter, which can often happen, um, but their editor might think differently about their, their subject, they'll take and edit the whole article. Sometimes they'll stick a headline on that has nothing to do with what was even discussed. So you have to be prepared for that to happen. You have to be prepared for disappointments and, you know, learn from your interviews. But I, I definitely want to say we all make mistakes in talking to the media. Uh, we always think of things that we could have said differently afterwards. And um, but the fact that any of you who are willing to speak out to the media uh, about sex worker advocacy is just a, a huge, powerful thing because we are the only ones that will speak for us. And so stepping up, you should congratulate yourself, applaud yourself, and um, don't beat yourself up about anything that you, you might feel you could have done differently. So the first thing to think about is what are your goals in doing this interview? What are your goals in being a spokesperson? Um, you know, first there's self-promotion. Uh, it's a great goal if you wanna promote your own work or yourself as an expert. Um, or if you're advocating for yourself, in, like in a crisis, um, you need to change people's attitudes about yourself in particular. So that's that's under the promotion part. Um, for people who are advocates, who are advocating for sex positive values or advocating for decriminalizing sex work, for example, it's it helps to depersonalize your talking points. It helps to um, to to pull back and. Um, talk about the general issues, to think about other people when you're talking so that you're talking more about the general shared experience. Um, sometimes in those cases, the more personal you get, you can actually um, stop focusing on the overarching message, which is very important for advocates to do. And then, of course, there's, you know, when you're protecting a group or business, your group is being attacked. Um, you're out there protesting something on the street. Um, you have to center um, that group and that that group's message and that protest's message rather than yourself 
or your own self-promotion. So you want to keep on target. And then there's other, you know, we have other goals. So it just helps to kind of identify what it is that you're trying to achieve by talking to the media and, and work from there. When we break these down a little bit further, you know, there's proactive media. That's the publicity effort. You can hire a PR firm. You can put out a press release. Anybody can put out a press release. It, ta- it costs about $1,500 to $2,000 with the really reputable firms, um, but it works. They'll get your message out on hundreds of websites, and then you'll get um, calls from other reporters because they've seen that. When they Google sex work, you know, you'll come up as one of the more recent things. Um, if you're reacting to media, if you're responding to unwanted media exposure, or if um, you're in a crisis, contact NCSF for help. We've done this so much that we can actually help you craft your sound bites. We can look at your story and kind of pull out the bits and pieces that we think it would be helpful for you to focus on. And it's sometimes helpful to get, you know, an outside view on that um, because we're so deep within our own stories, right? And then if you're uh, positioning yourself as an expert, you want to get your name out there. So you want to publicize yourself as an expert. And that includes, you know, going on podcasts. Excellent way to get your name out there as an expert. And there's tons of podcasts out there that you can go on and talk about um, sex worker advocacy, decriminalizing sex work, FOSTA, um, any, any kind of Thing, you can kind of like pitch to those podcasts and then you're kind of getting getting yourself out there. And then journalists who are writing articles about it will find you. You'll be their resource. So next you want to look at the types of media. Uh, it's really important what kind of media you're doing, how you craft the message um, and how you're going to approach it. So there's print media, which is newspapers, magazines. The online publications, they're mostly covering us now, um, the big uh, internet magazines. Um, podcasts, as we talked about, excellent way to get your word out there. And you know, it's not just like uh, sex worker advocate podcast, but LGBTQIA, mental health professionals. A lot of mental health professionals have podcasts now. So you can get onto their shows and talk about sex work. You know, it's a great way to do it. Radio has fallen down. Audio podcasts have really like kind of replaced that. But it used to be a great way, especially like the morning shows who want to have kind of fun with things to kind of get your message out in a lighthearted way. And then, of course, there is television Um, and TV. If you're going to be on TV, I do suggest that you either get a training or work with a partner, a friend, um, have them record you um, because we're often not aware of how we present on camera. Um, the way we sit, the way we hold our heads, um, you know, can make a big difference. And if you see yourself and you practice that way, you can actually feel much more comfortable. And and that that's an important thing. And then also under types of media, you have to consider their slant, their angle, right? Um, so there's sex positive stuff, Slate, BuzzFeed, Salon. I mean, you would think vice is sex positive. Sometimes it it, it can it can go either way. Um, so you have to be careful sometimes. Even even your favorite outlets uh, might take a slide that you're you might not appreciate afterwards. So you really want to um, look to what how they've covered sex work in the past. Um, sex negative. That's uh, tends to be you know the Fox cable news. Uh, groups like Christian Network Services, you have to be very careful when you're dealing with these um, organizations because you know they're going to add it to the negative. And you have to make sure that you are on point with your talking points, that you know what it is that you want to get across. You just say that um, so that if they use you, if they use a quote from you, it's going to be something that, that represents what you want to get out there. Then you have the local affiliates, like the the local Fox and network affiliates uh, are actually pretty good. They they cut to the chase. They really want to find out what the issue is. They're often responding to a a concern. So they want you to really get to the point quickly. And um, and they'll only show a couple of sound bites from whatever you do, whereas the weekly alternative paper, they might print a dozen sound bites from you because they're they have the space to dive into this more. 
So going into that kind of interview, you know whether you can be really expansive or if you need to like really keep it short and sweet, right? And then you have the national news, Times, USA Today, PBS. Um, those are often um, very interesting. They do a lot of background on this, so you don't have to be providing as much background information, um, which can be really helpful. And then, of course, cable. Um, and, and with the cable, you're actually on camera, in a studio, and uh, being mic'd up, uh, which is a level of intimidation. <laughs> so keep that in mind, which is why it's great to like practice um, and, and get to feel comfortable with it, right? So always do your research. Uh, always Google the reporter. Find out what they've been doing in the past, how they've covered it. Sometimes you'll get hold of a reporter who's never covered anything um, about sex work or um, sex or consent or anything like that, which is very interesting because um, then you have to maybe think about educating them a little bit more. Otherwise, you can get hold of reporters that this is their beat. This is what they cover. And then, you know, you can actually kind of go back a little bit and focus on your message. Um, you want to check for tone and content just to be aware, especially if if you do see headlines that don't match the content, you may want to bring up your concerns. Uh, what's going to be the heading? What's going to be the subhead? That could actually affect your decision of whether you want to do the interview or not, because this is all balls in your court. You get to choose what you want to participate in. And sometimes it may be something that you're not comfortable with right now, and you can actually decline and, and offer to pass the reporter on to some and uh, work your way up slowly. You know, don't feel like you have to do it. And that's what this slide is. Start slow. <laughs> because it can be very helpful to, um, you know, crawl before you walk and then walk before you run. So say ask for written questions prior to the interview. A lot of uh, journalists will be glad to send you the questions so that you can be prepared, even if it's going to be... Um, a uh, phone interview later or a television interview later, asking for the questions kind of gives you the baseline. What's All right, so that's what I was saying is start slow, right? Um, get the written questions, do the phone interviews with the sound bites right in front of you. Uh, even, you know, do any kind of audio podcast or radio interviews with your sound bites right in front of you. And while the person is asking, I'm sitting there scanning to figure out what I want to say not thinking about what they want me to say, right? Um, and uh, then kind of the next step up is an in-person interview with a print journalist because you're not able to have your sound bites. You're not, you're having to kind of work by the seat of your pants. Um, with Zoom, if you're pre-recording, if you're recording an interview, you can often still have your, your sound bites in front of you, but you have to be more aware of, of how you look rather than just reading them down like this. You have to be, you know, up and, and speaking to, to the reporters. Um, and then, of course, the, the most difficult and stressful is the in-person recorded interview. Um, so you can decide, I want to do this level of interview, but not those. Or you could say, hey, I have no problem being on camera. I feel very comfortable and jump right into that. Um, just practice. Practice with a friend. And if you're going to be doing any kind of promotion, create a media kit to attract the kind of media you want. This is NCSF's media package. If you go to our website and click on press, you'll see what our media package consists of. It's kind of um, uh, images, certain key talking points, like right now NCSF is really focused on explicit prior permission for consent to kink, uh, which is the new legal framework that's been created for um, kink activities. So... Um, you know, you want to put all that in there because that's the kind of media that you're trying to attract is people who are interested in that. All right, so on to interview tips. Again, uh, you know, this is a trigger warning for offensive content. I I want to go into specifics um, with sound bites that you can use in response to reporters' questions. And um, I feel like these questions are often offensive. Um, and so feel free to mute me if you want to, or leave if you need to for self-care. And if needed, I am available afterwards if anybody needs to speak to me, because I know that there is some trauma around all of this. Um, and there is there is uh, 
there is kind of an attempt to provoke you by, by reporters. Um, so it's kind of inherent in doing this. Um, but we go over this because we think it's really helpful to confront these kinds of questions um, rather than being put on the spot by a reporter when you're not prepared. So uh, in these sound bites that I'm gonna be talking about, it may sound completely like you're saying, I could never say that. That was not at all what I would say, um, which is fine. Um, please, you know, take these sound bites, put them into your own words. Um, you know, you wanna feel comfortable with what you're saying and how you're saying it. Um, and so that's why these sound bites sound like me. <laughs> um, and they might not sound like you, uh, but you can adjust them. Um, feel free to do that and put your own personality into them. So the first tip is you don't have to answer the interviewer's exact question. Um, and it, it sounds weird, but this is the key to dealing with the media because, you know, from kindergarten, we've been taught you have to answer somebody's questions. If they ask you a question, you have to answer. But that's not the way it goes in an interview. Um, it's not a conversation. And you're not there to convince them of anything. You're not there to, to convince them that decriminalizing sex work is the way to go. You're talking to them and they're gonna convey your message to the world. So that's the way you need to think about it. Not so much what they want from you, because a lot of times they don't even know what they want from you. Um, they're just trying to provoke a reaction or something that that's, sounds sensational or fits their stereotypes. Um, so you you need to keep control and you've got your list of sound bites. You've got your messaging. Sometimes it's only like 10 things and you stick to it. So, for example, the reporter asked, if we legalize prostitution, then won't more people be sex trafficked and abused? And you say sex work involves exchanging sex, sexual services for something of value. People involved in sex work make a decision to do this work out of choice or life circumstance the way people choose any type of work. There are various types of sexual labor raising, ranging from stripping to prostitution to adult film to fetish work. And this is SOAR Institute's um, suggested soundbite. This is great. You notice on the, on, on the one side, it's like um, prostitution, trafficked, abused. And then over here, it's your message that actually doesn't say any of those things. And, um, you know, what you want to do is put out the positive, right? So try to do that. Even though they're asking about trafficking and abuse, get your main point out there right off the bat. And don't worry if it's nonsensical. They're used to nonsensical interviews. They're used to professionals who do this all the time. And if you do this, if you answer with what you think is important, they actually respect you more. They will not have as long of an interview with you and you will get your message out there. So the next tip, keep repeating your sound bites. <laughs> and you know, you hear this a lot in a 30 minute interview, they will include one or two quotes, literally one or two. So if you just keep repeating your sound bites, they have to use that. If you kind of quest around, um, they don't like long rambling sentences. It's it's difficult to get a coherent thought out of a long sentence. So craft your sound bites so it's short sentences so they can cut out one if they want to, you know, um, and uh, and think about the fact that you're trying to speak in quotes. It's a different way of speaking. So your biggest problem is if you're trying to explain something and they pull a quote from the very end or out of the middle and it loses its context. Um, and a lot of times I'll find that, you know, if I say something off the cuff, you know, I, something that's not in my plan sound bites, I often think to myself, oh no, that's what they're gonna use. And then what do you wanna bet? That's what they end up using. I think because it sounds off the cuff, it sounds more spontaneous, but that's not important at all. Uh, when working with the media, you really, what you wanna get out is your careful, thoughtful sound bite, right? Rather than something that's spontaneous sounding. Um, so they'll also, the, they'll, report, they'll gravitate to shorter sentences. Um, you can educate a reporter and give background information. A lot of times I like to do that through uh, an email, right? So that you can actually send them links to sources. Um, and let them do the work rather than you sitting there trying to explain 
things, right? You want to just have your, your sound bites and your message. For example, uh, if the reporter repeats, but, but what about sex trafficking? Isn't that something we should all be concerned with? This is something that you might have to deal with because FOSTA has conflated sex trafficking and sex work uh, in people's minds. And this is kind of the thing we're trying to combat. So uh, you may need to address this if it's repeated, even if it's not something that you're there to talk about. Um, you can define sex trafficking and then spin it to the positive. Traffickers engage in isolation, invisibility, abuse of power, physical and or sexual abuse as a way of exercising control over survivors. Decriminalizing sex work would give the power back where it belongs to the sex workers who need to protect themselves. So you see how I kind of turn that so that it brings it back to the fact that we're the vulnerable population. We're the ones that need to be um, concerned about our safety. That is a very powerful message. It's the message that the kink communities use to get people to stop thinking that we were violent or out of control or mentally ill. We position the fact that we were being discriminated against and we were being persecuted and we were being attacked because of this perceived stigma. It's a very powerful message. It's something that they don't hear a lot. So the, the more often you can talk about you know, sex work as a marginalized population and needing protection, um, the better. Um, you can also say things like, you know, since since sex workers can't advertise because of FOSTA, they have to turn to third parties, which increases the chance of force or coercion. You know, things things of that nature. All right, another interview tip. Don't repeat negative or inflammatory phrases. It You make their point for them if you repeat what they say. Did you do this? Oh, no, I didn't do that. You know, that's our that's our impulse is to use what they say and deny it. Right. Um, they use those negative terms on purpose to, to try to get you to repeat them. Um, is it is it this? No, it's not. It's this. Um, it's no, it's not this. It's this. Right. So um, don't deny the question by repeating the question. Right. So if a reporter asks, FOSTA stops sex trafficking, surely that's a good thing. What about the poor people who need help? And what about the children? It's always, what about the children who are trafficked, right? Um, you can say it's always been illegal to traffic people in person or on websites. FOSTA does not take any practical steps towards identifying exploitative situations in assisting victims or in prosecuting traffickers themselves. In fact, this law makes it harder to help victims because websites are self-censoring or shutting down. So those that are left are less traceable or accountable. Now, see what I did there? I didn't repeat anything about the poor people who need help. I didn't repeat anything about the children, you know, um, because that's the opposition soundbite, right? That's their soundbite. And we feed into it when we repeat things like that. They claim that they're helping victims and minors. Um, so instead, you have to state your case that FOSTA is harming people um, and that we're the ones that are trying to help folks. Okay. So in all of that, it's an interview, not a conversation, right? Same thing as the very beginning, stick to your sound bites. Um, you know, you don't have to answer the question that's asked. Don't settle in for a good talk this person's not your friend and um and and they're looking to take advantage of you you kind of have to go in there prepared because they're looking to find the thing that's going to jump off the page or jump off the screen and get them noticed because you know they're they're workers too they they have a job often they're freelance and so they're trying to impress their editors so they have a different goal than you do and when two people sit down with two different goals, um, it's going to be a it's going to be a struggle. So that's why you have to give them what they need in a way that s serves your goal as well. Um, so if you feel yourself slipping into like a rapid back and forth, um, you may be saying things that you'll regret later. You you're saying things that are not in your sound bites, the things that were you considered were the most important things to say before that interview. Um, it, but they're going to try to make you comfortable. They're going to try to get you to chat them chat with them, stay friendly, but reserved. 
right? Polite and civil. Think before you speak. Go a little bit slower than you normally would when you're talking. Um, you know, if you're starting to say something and you realize, oh my gosh, I shouldn't be, stop in the middle. Don't, don't complete your thought. Um, start over again because they will use that new completed thought, completed sentence, rather than the one you had to stop. Um, and always, you know, when there's a pause in the conversation, we kind of want to rush to fill it. A lot of times they'll ask their question, you'll say their sound bite, your sound bite, and then there's going to be a long pause. That pause is designed to get you to say more. And so what you need to do is just sit there and wait it out, you know, just smile and wait and see what is their next question. They might even say, can you explain further? You can just repeat your soundbite. <laughs> well, and say exactly what you just said before, because you don't need to explain further. You really don't. If you've got a soundbite, it says what you want to say. Um, so think of it more like a tweet or a telegraph. You're keeping it short, not uh, not a novel, right? So for example, a reporter could could push, you know, surely it's a good thing that Craigslist is gone before gone is gone because of FOSTA. And then you can say FOSTA SESTA affects the safety of sex works, sex, sex workers, making it dangerous for everyone. Um, and, and this is a good example of not getting into the weeds. Craigslist is not gone because of FOSTA. It had nothing to do with FOSTA, right? But you're not here to defend Craigslist right? You're not here to explain the timeline of everything, right? Because that really doesn't serve what it is that you're trying to get across. What you're trying to get across is that it affects our safety. And we're speaking out because we are now unsafe because of this law, right? Because we can't network with our, our clients the way we need to, right? So that's the, that's the point. And I find that if somebody's pushing like this, if a reporter keeps pushing, I shorten my sound bites even more. So I'm giving them less and less and less and they get it. They finally stop. Uh, and uh, they, cause they realize the tactics not working. And, you know, honestly, reporters love a professional when people can go in and calmly stick to what they want to say. They admire that because everything that they've done has, has taught them how to not have that happen. Right. So they'll they'll work with you at that point. They'll realize this is a professional here. Uh, this is somebody who is going to give me what they want. And that's it. So, for example, here it is. Uh, oh, we did this great. So the next one is um, universalize the questions to keep from being taken out of context. This is super important. Um, figure out before you go in how much of your personal life you want to talk about. Um, I suggest you write out your story, how you got into sex work, what it is that you like about it, um, you know, what you don't like about it, right? Um, and then take a look at that and boil it down to a couple of sound bites. You do not need to give your entire history to a reporter. You want to figure out what is what from your personal story enhances the goal that you have in giving an interview. Um, and that's, again, something you can come to NCSF and we can we can help you with that. Um, so when I started talking about kink, I'm very kinky, right? But um, they would ask me, they would ask, what do you like to do? What do you want to do? Um, why do you do this? How does it feel? Like all those normal questions, right? Um, but I refused to answer any of that because I was there talking as an advocate for kink. And so um, I, I just would say, I'm, I'm kinky. I'm proud to be kinky. And that's it. Uh, and next question, please. Right. <laughs> so think about other people that are going to be affected by your interview. When you put out and you're talking about sex work, you're you're in some ways speaking for all of us. Right. So you have to kind of include them in your sound bites, And that helps you generalize more in terms of what is going to affect all of us. And that's, those are the key points. You know, you a lot of people say, oh, give the personal, it's super important. That's how you connect with people. Um, not so much when you're talking about something like this. Um, uh, sometimes people can't connect with us on the basis of our history. Um, sometimes they focus on our history rather than focusing on the message. Uh, and you're not gonna have trouble getting people who are willing to talk to you. 
because not many people are willing to talk about sex work. So you don't have to give them anything that you don't want to give them. You know, empower yourself, right? So for example, why did you give in to sex work? What do you do with Johns? Have you ever been hurt by one? You know, all these purient, horrible questions you're going to get. You can say something like, I've been a proud sex worker for over 10 years, ever since I was getting my degree. I wish my industry was decriminalized so that I could access the same social services that any other worker in America can get, right? So you see again, you know, talking a little bit, that's the point I wanted to pull out from my, my history, you know? Um, I, I feel good including my degree, you know, that's something I'm proud of. Uh, and then spin it to, I wish, I wish sex work was decriminalized because it would make my life easier, right? I would have the same uh, ability to access these things as other people. Uh, and again, that whole any other worker in America, I really think the whole sex work is work, is um, such a sound thing to focus on, right? Uh, so you'll notice I didn't answer any of those sensationalized questions, not a single one. <laughs> Why? What do you do? Have you ever been hurt? None of those. Because, you know, me talking about maybe a bad experience I had with somebody is not going to get my message across, right? So I just stay away from it, uh, stay away from the graphic details. And in a case like this, when they're really pushing on kind of a purient kind of stuff, if they ask again, I say, next question, please. And then just sit there and wait. Either they're going to ask me another question or the interview's at an end. Either way, it's no problem for me, right? Remember that your quote can be taken out of context. And this is one of the, the problems of, of, you know, giving a long or extended rambling message. They can pull something out. And you often don't even hear the question, either in a TV interview or in a print interview. You just see the answer. So everything needs to be standing alone, which is why it's so important to plot this out before you, you go into an interview. For example, the reporter says to you, a lot of people support sex work nowadays. I think there's too many people hiding behind religious morality, and that's the problem. And this is a different tactic, kind of ingratiating themselves with you so that you open up. You feel like this person understands. You feel like you can talk frankly and openly with them because they get it. Don't say, so true. Some of my clients are very religious. They come to see me, but then after they get off, they're busy pretending they're so righteous at their Bible study class right? That's what you'd say to a friend, fellow sex worker, right? That is not for public consumption because this is how it will appear. Sex workers are trying to make it legal to sell sex on the street corners and perhaps even in residential neighborhoods in our city, dun, 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 right? State assembly person says sex work will never be legalized in our state. We have to protect the children. What if they want to set up a brothel next to my church? And a sex worker advocate insists some of my clients are very religious. They come to see me, but then after they get off, they're busy pretending they're so self-righteous in their Bible study class, right? So anything that you say that would be just among us chickens, you know what I mean? Like uh, we understand each other, can, can and will be taken out of context um, by reporters. So um, instead... They ask that exact same question. They say the same. It's not even a question. It's them just saying what they think you want to hear. A lot of people support sex work nowadays. And then you say, we know that much of sex work is already legalized. Decriminalization of prostitution would allow us to establish regulations that everyone could live with. Right. At one point, we were comparing it to uh, the medical marijuana and uh, marijuana decriminalization there's there's so many people have different views of that it's hard to do that anymore but the the tactic is still the same there can be regulations so these seemingly scary things you know are perfectly fine right so you want to you want to talk about oh no decriminalization regulations yes we're law abiding citizens you want to get that out there instead right and uh think about reasonable people Right. There's a lot of reasonable people who agree with us out there who understand we're talking about consenting adults. Speak to them. Um, but you don't have to share the details of our industry. <laughs> right. Um, if you need a moment, you can ask them to clarify their question. 
Uh, it helps you control the flow of the interview. You hold all the cards. They're coming to you. They they need a quote from you. Um, so it's always good to, I ask them questions. Why are you doing this? What is it that you're looking to achieve? You know what I mean? Get them talking about themselves. If they want to be really chatty, ask questions. They're not going to print you asking them questions. And it helps you get control of the interview, right? What do you think about that? You know, if they say something about, about uh, decriminalization, you know, turn it around. What do you think about that? It gives you a chance to uh, to rest, to to kind of regrip, and don't worry about them walking away. Once they're in an interview with you, they're going to take what they can get um, because uh, they're always desperate to find people. And then we have, don't do or say anything you don't want to appear in print or TV. Um I had this, you know, I really stuck to my guns. And then I had a, a Time Magazine interview and they wanted me to pose by a St. Andrew's cross with a crop in my hand. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. That's not, uh, first of all, that's not who I am. It was completely wildly inappropriate for me. Um, but uh, that becomes the story. That image becomes the story. So, um, you know, they may want you to pick up sex toys while you're talking or sit on a bed. Don't ever sit on a bed. You don't need to reinforce that stereotype. Um, and if you say something that you kind of don't, you know, you regret or something, you can always request, don't, you know, that was off the record. Please don't use that. It doesn't mean that they'll do it. Um, I have certainly had things that I have requested be off the record printed. Um, so it's better if you just don't get into a, a, a tangent with them. And also one thing, just don't talk about kids. Don't talk about your own kids. Don't talk about anything to do with under 18, because that will be included. No matter what else you say, that quote will be included. And it's because it's very sensationalized because, you know, it's reinforcing their stance that sex work somehow is bad for the kids. It can also cause child custody issues for yourself. NCSF does help um, sex workers who are having custody issues. And, um, and, and we see it because family courts are prejudiced, you know, and, um, you don't want to have to fight that fight. So I would just, even if they bring in children, just avoid the question, right? For example, big name sports figure was arrested in a sex worker sting, but not charged. What, what do you think of that kind of double standard? Don't say big name sports figure has a problematic history. I read somewhere that he was accused of sexual assault, but the DA refused to press charges. There's privilege for you. Well, you're absolutely right, right? Um, but not in the context of an interview. You don't ever want to name somebody. Defamation is a huge issue right now. So don't name groups or individuals and accuse them of anything criminal um, because uh, you'll get a, a, an email or a letter from a, an attorney and uh, nobody wants to get caught up in that. And, and they will. They want to really drag in those big name people uh, because it's it's newsworthy, right? So instead, you say the risk is almost always on the sex worker side, since FOSTA sex workers have had to vet new clients in person, placing them in potentially dangerous situations. That's because ties to vetted and established clients have been severed by sh the shutting down of adult websites. You know, that's a standalone quote. You can be proud to appear next to your name, right? Capsulates everything that you're trying to say. Again, it has nothing to do with big name sports figure that they're trying to get you to talk about, you just spin it, you know, to the risk is on our side. Right? We're the ones that need help and support. Uh, we're the ones not getting the support that we need. And then uh, your appearance. And I know that this is like another one of those things where I'm not trying to tell you not to be yourself, right? Um, but the way that you appear is going to almost say much more than your words. If you're animated, if you're confident, people are going to see that and they're going to respond to that, right? If you're nervous or angry, sometimes we're at these protests and we're so angry. People can't relate to that. It kind of puts a wall up. Even then you need to pull back and be like, yes, we're here to help support survivors and make sure that everybody can access the services they need. You know what I mean? Like that's a, that's a happy message even though we're trying to fight a real serious wrong. Um, so uh, keep keep in mind, 
people are going to be either reading or looking at this in their living room. <laughs> they're not going to be angry. So they, they're going to be off put if they see that from you, right? Um, you also need to craft your appearance. And for example, I wore pearls and a suit when I went on sh the Sean Hannity show. And he was pissed. He was pissed. He wanted me to show up in some sort of outfit where he could, you know, kind of mock me. Um, he knew that my appearance was going to speak thousands of words for me, right? I looked like the people who were watching, right? So whenever possible, dress like the reporter, right? If it's something like a Fox News, put a jacket on, put a button down shirt on or a black shirt like this. You know what a black shirt like this evokes? Wait staff. We're in the service industry, right? Wait staff brings delicious food to people. They love wait staff. So if you wear a black sweater, a black t-shirt, um, black pants, it, it evokes the sense that we want to give, which is we are in an important service industry here. We're doing an important service. We're providing things that people need, right? They can identify with us in that mode. Um, so keep that in mind when you're doing an interview, um, you're a messenger for the entire industry, right? So you're not just out there showing your personal style, you're speaking for a bunch of different people. And we want to, we want to make it identifiable as much as possible, right? And like if you're, if you're doing a TV interview, for example, like find a place to sit where there's not a lot of distractions happening. Um, if you're going to be outside, parks are good, but be careful about what's in the background. You don't want to have like a, a jungle gym or kids running through. I like to put myself in front of greenery um, and I'll position myself where the sun's not in my eyes and I'm not squinting. And it's like, well, I don't care. This is where I'm standing. You're, if you're going to, if you want to take this interview, this is where I'm standing. You know, something green is nice and accessible to people. Right. <laughs> And so even if you do sound just like even in print, if you sound confident, if you sound assured, um, the reporter will respect you more. I hate to say it, but they they respect that. Um, they respect people who will control the flow um, and they respect people who treat them politely. They're doing a job just like you're doing a job. So don't ever, even if they're doing things that get you mad or upset you, don't react by being mad or upset. Um, are disdainful of them because then that's what they'll take. And that's not the message we want to get out to the masses, right? And then lastly here, we've got a couple of interview tips in terms of, you know, referencing other experts, you know, look up surveys, academic publications where sex work has been decriminalized or how FOSTA is failing, you know, have those at your fingertips. It's very important to have a couple of those as your sound bites. And then refer to other advocacy organizations, SOAR Institute, which we've been seeing their sound bites, Woodhull, of course, Decriminalized Sex Work, SWAP, National Coalition for Sexual Freedom. If you don't want to do the interview, refer the reporter to us. Um, NCSF does a lot of interviews uh, when people are in crisis. We don't actually speak for the person. We just talk about the communities in general, the industry in general, um, so that, that they have something that is positive and you don't have to be put on the spot. So you, you can get help, you, you don't need to go it alone. And then after the interview, if there's comments allowed, manage the comments, um, take a look at what's happening, stick to your sound bites, keep putting it out there. You know, if somebody's being a troll, just ignore them. You know, they'll remove bad comments or things that are abusive. Um, especially if you keep a good positive relationship with the reporter, they'll definitely deal with that for you. And then also you can ask people to come on and comment. So, so we kind of all pile on. We should all be helping each other do that. Every time somebody does an interview, we should put the word out to everybody in, in email. I just did this interview. And so we can go on and comment positively and be supportive. Right. And then things to stay away from. Be careful of making jokes. You know, people's humor is very different. I sometimes sounds like, sound like a little sex positive robot, right? Because I'm just speaking about my stuff. I'm not trying to joke. I'm not trying to laugh with them. I'm not trying to like make friends with them because humor can really uh, go wrong on you very fast. Um, and context control as well because it can be pulled out and inserted as you saw. Um, 
sometimes we go to college campuses and participate in sex weeks and give workshops. Be very careful because if the media picks it up, they're going to talk about um, tax dollars going to support to pay you, right? Um, a lot of times I like to say, I'm a volunteer, I'm contributing my time. You know, if there is any money given, you can um, say, you know, we're being compensated, like every speaker at this at this college are being compensated. You can develop sound bites, but just be prepared because that is a constant. And then of course, anything about under 18 year olds, as I said before. And then there's other things like we can like look at it. We'll, we'll look at some clips and you might come up with other ideas of like, Ooh, I want to stay away from that um, because that is not the, um, the way I want to represent myself. And then practice. It really helps. Just sit down, practice, practice, practice. You get to know your, your material instinctively. I can give a, a, an interview now. I don't even have sound bites in front of me. <laughs> I know what to say because I've done it so many times and I've repeated myself so many times. But um, in NCSF committees, we spend a lot of time coming up with talking points for people so that they can talk about the issues that are important to us. Um, don't feel bad that it's going to take the spontaneity out or something like that. No, it works. We've managed to really destigmatize the alt sex communities. And that's why kink and polyamory are just so pervasive today. Uh, NCSF has done a lot of work with the media to make them accepting of what we do. Um, so this is the important thing to do to practice, to kind of feel nimble, to feel confident, um, think on your feet, to, to kind of go against the disruptive questions and, and be able to give your sound bites so that your message is getting across. So that's it for the slideshow. Um, uh, thank you so much for uh, paying attention. I know a slideshow can be a little tough sometimes, but um, hopefully you can go back and pause and take a look at the bits. Um, and this will be useful as a recording for people in the future.